Hi, you're listening to Cat Tales, and my guest today really needs no introduction. She's appeared in the 1978 film Jubilee and Quadrophilia the following year. Her early hit singles included It's a Mystery and I Want to Be Free, and by 1982 she had made two platinum-selling albums. And after more than 40 years in the music business, she is as creatively hungry as she was in her teens. She's a singer, an actress, a writer, a punk, rebel and an icon. But most importantly, she's an independent, strong woman who doesn't take any prisoners. This is the one with Toya Wilcox. I am this ridiculous time we're in. <laughs> well, I certainly won't be promoting concerts. <laughs> I know, I know. It's terrible, isn't it? Everybody's saying the same thing. It's like they've had tours and had to cancel it all. And oh, it's it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Yeah, well, the thing is, I, a lot of us have been building to this year, and it's it's been a, a phenomenal journey from about 2001 that the wave of um, 80s being so popular has been incredible. But a lot of artists have just been building to this year with their kind of independence. Mm. So yes, we do all these fantastic festivals and we do these multi-star lineups, but. Quite a few of us have worked really hard to go out and be solo on tour. And and this year, um, I I was supposed to be going out with Hazel O'Connor on a completely sold out tour, but also my own tours at the same time. So it's very, very frustrating. Oh, it must be. Actually, I saw about the uh, the tour that you were doing with Hazel and I thought that's going to be a must see. So I'm not surprised to hear it's been sold out. Well, it's still going to happen. And I think what will happen once we find a way of being out in the open safely, and I suppose the most obvious way that's going to happen is a vaccine, I think we're going to have a a decadent um, 20s. We're going to go back 100 years to a lifestyle of complete decadence. I think we're all like pressure cookers waiting to go off. And we're going to party, party, party. And I know from talking to venues and promoters from my side, the venues need as much help as they can get. So even though this year was going to be one of the busiest years of my life, I think next year is going to be beyond the busiest years of all our lives because we're going to be opening the venues, helping the venues, keeping those venues running almost 24 hours a day so that the rock economy can get back on its feet. I think next year, technically, and kind of wishful thinking is going to be an incredible year. Do you know, I think that's a really good observation. You could be it, you could be right, as long as we can all hold on that long, which with the human spirit, we will do, won't we? It'll be like the end of the war years, won't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, OK, we, we are in recession. And I mean, I'm not earning a penny for 14 months, but, you know, I can survive. But but I still, the passion to work and the, the passion to be in front of my audience is not diminishing, it's growing. And uh, I think it's the same for everyone. And come the point where we can all go out there and work, I, I just think we are going to just run our socks off and make everything come back the way we knew it, but much better. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And you do sound so passionate about stuff, which is so refreshing with 40 years in the industry. You know, you sound actually more alive now than you probably ever have done. Well, I think like many artists of my age, um, I, I turned 62 on Monday. It's, you know, we're in control of our lives now. And what we do, we do because we really love it. And I don't feel the pressure I was under in my 20s. Mm. Um, your, when you're a new coming artist and you've got to just keep coming up with new looks, new music, and it was relentless. And um, I found it very, very, um, it, it, it wasn't conducive to being creative. Whereas these days where we can go about our lives as kind of 60 somethings it, it's we we're driving the engine we can put out there when we're ready to put out there and it makes life a lot more rewarding absolutely and I think the 60s the new 40 isn't it I think it's the new 30s personally <laughs> yes I didn't enjoy my 30s so I'm determined that 60 is going to make up for that the autumn years are the best years 
So, look, you've got lots and lots of strings to your bow. I mean, you started out in acting. You're better known as a musician, probably, but you do presenting, producing, voiceover, writing. That's a lot of balls to have in the air, Toya. (laughs) What's your preference, then, or are you just a good juggler? Um, I like to be busy, uh, and if I can do it and do it well, I'm going to do it. So, uh, it's obviously, I love music, but I... I can't relentlessly stay tuned in that way. It it drains you. So I find going away, doing a film, doing a stage play or voiceovering or making a documentary, they refuel me. They they kind of give me new ideas. They connect me to new people. So I find it's all complementary. It, it all helps the other. And it's... I find it very healthy, and I think a lot of people are are working that way. I know when I started in the business, I think 42 years ago, you couldn't do that. People wouldn't allow you to do that. There was so much snobbery in every area. But now I think you're able to do it, and people still respect you and see you for who and what you are. Yeah, I, I totally agree, actually. It's more like the entertainment business now, isn't it, rather than having those specific genres that you couldn't cross over those boundaries, which, you know, I suppose, as you say, it helps your creativity in different areas. Yes, totally. Uh, it does. I, I agree. But also, I think with the internet, everything has become slightly diluted. So I remember when when I started um, my career, I was at the National Theatre. I was 18 years old, and this is in London. And actors just wouldn't do voiceovers. Actors wouldn't do adverts. um, Stage actors wouldn't do TV. And they had no money. (laughs) (laughs) Learning... Um, from an, an actor who didn't act much but made over 75k a year 42 years ago <laughs> doing voiceovers everyone was just dribbling at the thought of it so I, I think we live in a much more balanced world um, I, I don't think people beat themselves up so much over those kind of snobberies anymore that's true and I think that's possibly down to the internet as you say isn't it and, and social media being a big influence really I mean, for me, this learning curve on, on this particular lockdown is being social media because I'm, I'm slightly technophobic and I've had to learn how to do it and I've had to turn it around to give myself presence. And it's been a fabulous journey in, in that alone in, in that I got my first um, 1.2 million hits on something I posted. And all of that is such... An important thing in this time that you can stay connected to your audience via social media. So it's all a learning curve. I'm quite an insular person. When I'm being creative, which is virtually every day, it's a silent process. It's not a process where I want a phone in my hand. So I've had to learn a way that I can connect to my fans through social media. And what I'm doing, I absolutely love. And it's just posting slightly dada-istic films um, to make them laugh. Uh, And it's done me the world of good. My agent's calling me every day and saying, do you know so-and-so's just seen this? Do you know (laughs) so-and-so to book you because of this film? And it's worked. And I'm very, very grateful. It's wonderful. I've been been watching some of them. I've been having a right laugh at you in the tutu and uh, Robert there doing (laughs) doing the Swan Lake impression, which is wonderful. That's a controversial one. It made the headlines in Italian newspapers, that one. Did it? Because Italians um, pride themselves on being almost exclusively intellectual. And for Robert to do that, my husband's Robert Fripp of the Bank King Crimson, for him to do that was um, blasphemous. And you had super uber authors in Italy debating this. And my husband is not a kind man if you criticize him. And he attacked these people online. And again, that was making headlines. Um, It's well known in the industry. If you diss my husband, he'll diss you a (laughs) hundred times more. And this was making headlines. And my husband found it very entertaining. And last week, um, he had a journalist say in an Italian newspaper, the top newspaper, Oh, yes, I was reading an interview with Fripp. I mean, not even having met him or interviewed him myself. Yeah. I read an interview with with Fripp, and I came to the conclusion he's a jerk. Well, boy, was that the red rag to the ball. <laughs> oh, 
idea. Now, well, first of all, it's terrible for him to say that without, well, say it full stop. But they're not even, you know, meeting I mean, him. They, I mean, this, the power of, we all have a voice now. So it's been very, very enlightening um, and at sometimes entertaining. Absolutely. And what's lovely about that is it's still that rebellious side of, of your nature and Robert joining in there, creating it for you. How wonderful is that? You know, <laughs> you're known for your rebellion, aren't you? Yeah, I think my rebellion is slightly kinder. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I, I've just never conformed to this thing about age. Uh, I think age is a privilege. I think the fact we live so long is a privilege. Um, but it doesn't mean that I diminish. And I, I am just totally against this attitude, especially within the music industry. I, I think it's improving in TV and film now that because a woman hits a certain age, she's no longer a, a sexually driven or desirable creature and no longer has thoughts. That's changing, but in the music business, it's going to take a bit longer mm. to do that. But thank goodness, my audience and my generation still love what I do. And I, I always say to my audience, the reason I'm standing on this stage is because of you. Yeah. Um, and it is you only. So I, you know, I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really you know great thing to say about actually we're still the same people even though we're aging and everybody's aging but there is this attitude against women isn't there and it's a, such a ridiculous concept that you're only desirable or you're only talented or whatever when you're young it's, it's bizarre well I mean obviously when we're young the energy is um, 10 times stronger but I think the whole thing about growing old is we become better we become enriched we become deeper and, and that needs to, I think, be recognized and appreciated um, because, I, you know, we have so much to offer. We've been there. We've seen it. We've got the T-shirt. We know the warning signs. So we have just so much to give. Uh, and I, I also think with the lockdown and everything and with the Internet being what it is, we've been able to explain ourselves a bit better because that's given us a platform but musically I find that okay I'm still Toya I still have my voice I still sound like Toya um, technically I'm a better singer than I have ever been because when I started out um, I, I was singing through pure will and ambition and determination now I'm technically a singer I'm really really good at what I do yeah. and I just don't want to not use that uh, it, it's a gift and when it comes to writing uh, my writing is clearer but and I don't feel under the pressure to do four albums a year which people would have had me do 42 years ago but the creativity and that flow and the connection with my audience is very, very alive. And I just don't want to be told that I should slow down. It's, it, it's such a bizarre thing to be told. When you can see your finite amount of time, I find I'm speeding up and I'm trying to fill that time positively with the best work I can possibly do because I know that is the memory I leave behind and memories have value. Absolutely it's your legacy isn't it and that's really your purpose on this world is is uh, is finite as you say and to have something that you can in fact leave that's tangible and has touched so many people it is absolutely wonderful. I know and I think prime examples of that is George Michael, Prince, Michael Jackson, I'm, I, I, yeah. Hendrick, Bowie I mean, it's just such an example of the power of our lives. Um, of the power of our lives continue. So I, I really value the time I have. Yeah, I, I, to I totally agree. And, and, it's, and it's great that you can actually tap into all that experience that you've had over the years, isn't it? And, and so your writing, for example, is possibly, as you say, more enriched because of it. Yeah, At, And because of experience, I just want my next album to be a danceable album. I, I want to go out next year and perform music where you see tens of thousands of people dancing and dancing and dancing because I think we all need to just celebrate this together. Yeah, you're right. And it's nice to hear that you're saying that you want to do something a little bit different with that. I mean, that's your sort of your trademark, really, of 
of, of progressing through the years, doing something different through the years. I mean, just even going back to the the early days, having such amazing um, hairstyles and you know the, the makeup and everything was was very of the moment, grabbing it while you could. But you yeah. changed and moved with the times, and I think that's really good. Yeah, I I, I never well part there's two there's two reasons for this. I'm auditioning for movies virtually every day. And I can't send um, a film in because at the moment we're all self-taping. I can't do that. I've got pink hair. (laughs) You you can't send a film to a world-class director if you look like a punk rocker and you're reading for um, a a woman from the 18th century. So I've I've had to kind of control my look. Uh, And also, I just didn't want to look or even attempt to look how I did 42 years ago it's not right the only woman I know who can get away with that is Sandra Rhodes because she is a designer she's absolutely stunning she's brilliant and that is her trademark for me my trademark is energy and my voice so uh, I just I want to look good at 62 that's what I want yeah, absolutely. And don't you just, I have to say, I'm, I'm admiring your your uh, your energy, your look and everything. You look wonderful, I have to say. So, uh, Tor, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to play Sensational, just for you, off your album In the Court of the Crimson Queen, because you are. We'll be right back in a moment. Hey, little wonder. We'll be fine, we're gonna fly
Hello, I'm Toya Wilcox, and you're listening to Cat Tales. Um, what I was going to think about uh, just talking about there was about this idea of nonconformism and rebellion. And have you found that actually that has left you, that feeling of wanting to rebel, and you've just held on to the energy and tapping into your experience? Or is there still something that you feel that you can rebel against? I feel as though I rebel every day, and it's purely that kind of theme of ageism again. Uh, I also feel I rebel every day because since I got married 34 years ago, I've always been the little woman at home in the eyes of men. Mm -hmm. I rebel against that all the time. Um, So my rebellion is ongoing. It's slightly more sophisticated. I... I'm not a political person, and I think where rebellion is very, very valuable is in the political field. But I just don't think that way. So my rebellion is is a lot more gentle, but it's definitely there, and it's definitely a way of life. And part of that is I just will not conform to someone else's view of what a woman should be. Uh, and that will always be with me. Um, and apart from that, I think within my work... My rebellion is still there because, again, I just don't think I can conform. I don't fit in. And this started when I moved into the outside world at the age of four and a half and went to school. I just realized I was never going to quite fit in. And if you're always a square peg trying to fit into a round hole, you're you're not in the right place. You, You find your place. And for me, it's by being observationally different. So I just am me and I won't kind of hone those edges. Yeah, and I, I read, um, you know, part of some of the interviews you've obviously done before, but um, saying about you had like a violent childhood and you were sort of kicking back against everything. Do you look back at that now and think, you know, that you overreacted to things or was that just part and parcel of growing up and trying to hone this energy? Um, okay, my, my, my background, I wouldn't say was violent. Um, it was mentally aggressive it was psychologically cruel so um i i didn't understand this till i was an adult so i my rebellion was i had to get out of that situation and i had to have my independence and that still remains whenever i feel trapped that just still remains i need my independence it it made me very solitary and distrusting um i'm a bit better on the trust front but uh, my my background was um, an all girls school, with where the clever clever girls attacked the non clever girls. Mm. Slight physical disability that was amused many people a lot of the time. Um, my nickname was Hopalong, uh, and an exceptionally unkind mother who thought she was being kind. So my reaction was was over the top. But it was my way of surviving. Um, So I think that has definitely made me who and what I am today. Um, My mother and I reconciled in the last two years of her life. But even two weeks before she died, we were having ferocious shouting matches. We were just not made for each other. And that happened. Um, and but we still loved each other. I, I held her as she died. So you know you can still experience love for someone that you just will never ever agree with. Yeah, personalities, isn't it? Everybody's an individual, and you've got your own life that you need to lead. And people need to recognise that and give freedom, don't they? Yeah, but I I would also say for anyone out there, nurture above everything is all that counts. If you have a child and your child pisses you off, nurture is the only thing that works. And the only time I feel I've ever really had nurture is when I met my husband, who who is phenomenal at nurture. And he's taught me so much about giving nurture back. It's a very, very powerful, creative thing to do. And... I I mean, I remember I phoned my mother in 1982 when I won Best Female Vocalist in what is now the Brit Awards. And she said, well, don't boast about it. It'll never happen again. And I ignored it. And I explained what the award looked like. And she said, well, don't fall on it. It will kill you. I mean, she did not have one good thing to say to me in um, 55 years. Oh, It sounds a bit like jealousy, though, to be honest. 
No, I think she had a similar background. I think something terrible happened to her when she was young. If she had therapy and could talk about it, we'd have got over it. But, you know, it's, I am who I am because I've been in self-defense for so long. And I think that's made me feel a lot of empathy towards those I work with and towards my audience because I just realize how damaging negativity is. Um, and it's why I, I kind of don't engage personally on a daily level on social media because I've had so many years of just being pushed back all the time that my tolerance is non-existent. So I, I lose myself in my work and, and by bringing other people joy and that's my way of, of nurturing and it's hugely important to me hugely important yeah that sounds lovely and part of that nurturing of course is 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 releasing material isn't it that you know that it's going to partly be your legacy but it sounds to me like it's important that it moves somebody emotionally as well yeah i i think i definitely agree i think it's very important when you're writing to be truthful to yourself, but also to remember someone is going to be listening to it, uh, and I feel very responsible about that. It, it's When I've written my most intensely emotional stuff, um, a song on my album last year in the Court of the Crimson Queen is called Dance in the Hurricane, which is about the loss of my parents. Mm. And when that came out, the response was huge. And I think it was just holding a mirror up and, and people seeing themselves and there was recognition. So I think it's really important um, to write about things that help people recognize in themselves. And it's taken me a long time to get there, a long time, um, which is why I'm pretty determined to keep writing. And in your tour with, uh, with Hazel, are you going to be touching upon some of this kind of material? What's that going to look like when people actually come to see you? Oh, I think my tour with Hazel is going to be a non-stop party because <laughs> it's a circumstance and everything. Um, Hazel and I have a lot of hits mm. and we, we both agree we're doing the hits. So, uh, but luckily, um, my album last year was a hit. So we will be doing Dance in the Hurricane and Sensational, which was a single off it and, and other tracks. But I've had well over 14 top 40 hits. So oh, no. They're, they're going to be in there, and the same with Hazel. So we, we've already rehearsed. I mean, obviously, we're going to have to rehearse again. We didn't expect a two-year break or whatever. <laughs> so uh, it, it will be a hit. Hazel wants to open because she works in a trio, and then my band will come on and work with her. There'll be an interval, then I come on, and it, that's nothing to do with star billing. It's just the way that the sonics work of the evening. And then Hazel and I do a set together, and it's going to be absolutely wonderful. It, it, it's, it's going to be riotous. It sounds amazing. I can't wait to see it, actually, I have to say. So, but you're sold out. So, But you must put more dates on, because people are going to be listening to this thinking, I've got to go to that. <laughs> but there will be tickets available, because obviously we, we, we're rescheduling. So everyone that's got tickets, those tickets are valid. But if you can't make the date we've rescheduled to, those tickets become available. So it'll, it's all on my website, toyawilcox.com, two L's in Wilcox. All the information and the updates are there. So um, if you want to come, you know, look, look at the venue and see if they have availability because this is a very fluid experience. Um, everything is changing weekly. So just keep informed yeah keep an eye of it and in the meantime they can of course um you know buy your dvd anthology for toya and the humans can't they um on the 3rd of july toya and the humans is a, a three cd box set that's also going to have accompanying vinyl coming out as well and this is my very experimental art rock band with bill reeson who was the drummer in rem uh, and it's three albums that we made together. The first album is very stripped down. I wanted to do music that was completely stripped bare. And then the second album, um, Sugar Rush, is really rocky. And so it's phenomenal. And then the third album, Strange Tales, is, is melodic and beautiful. And so the whole three albums is, is a kind of harmonic journey. Um, also out at the moment is Toya Solo, and Toya Solo 
is albums that I have released since about 1985, oh. and that is a beautiful package. So that that is Minx, Desire, Ophelia Shadow, Take the Leap, Velvet Lined Shell. That's a real fan collector's piece. And also we've got In the Court of the Crimson Queen. So there's a lot going on. All those are on Demon, um, which is part of BBC. And then next year, all my early albums come out. So it's kind of a huge year for me. It is. We've got Blue Meaning, Anthem, Sheep Farming in Barnet, Toya, 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 Changeling. They're all being re-released. Wow, that's that's brilliant. And what a treat for everybody to actually be able to get their hands on those. And they look amazing, what I've seen there. And I've seen also you're doing some vinyl as well, aren't you? The vinyl is beautiful. Everything that I'm, that I'm releasing is multicoloured and the, the vinyls are just gorgeous. Um, every colour in the spectrum. Uh, and there's quite a lot of vinyl out there. In the Court of the Crimson Queen has crimson vinyl. Um, Toya Solo each CD has a different color, the CD. With the human spinal, you've got a beautiful, deep egg yolk yellow. You've got a wonderful kind of khaki, bright olive green. And then you've got a, a wonderful purple color for Strange Tales. It, it, it's just the most beautiful packaging. You, I wouldn't expect anything less from you, Toya. Let's be honest, you're colourful in every single way and it's absolutely wonderful. So I think people need to go on your website and have a look at all that because there's plenty to see, plenty to watch. And obviously with you on social media, it's very entertaining as well. And there's also a lovely website, which is a fan site. Um, it's an archive site called Toya.net. And that's phenomenal. He, Davey, who runs that, knows more about me than I do. <laughs> he knows when I'm about to do a TV before I know it. it. He really is ahead of the game, and I love that website. So you've got toyawilcox.com and Toyanet. If you really want to stay informed, that's all you need. That's it. It's all there for the taking, isn't it? Well, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. You're an absolute sensation, let's say it that way. And I'm sure this is going to be a very, very popular interview. So I can't wait to see you when you're on uh, on tour again. So I'll be there. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Have a lovely day. And yes, yeah, stay safe. OK, bye for now. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to Cactus. To listen again to this and other tales, go to cattails.co.uk.